This is a quick introduction to simple harmonic motion, abbreviated to be SHM. Um, interestingly, those are my initials, but slightly rearranged. Um, I'm not going to tell you what my middle name is. Anyway, uh, some examples first of all to sort of get you in the real world uh, understanding of what they are. If you have this thing here, uh, which swings side to side, we call it a pendulum. Um, a pendulum is an example of pendulum is an example of simple harmonic motion. Um, another example of simple harmonic motion would be a mass bouncing on a spring. Um, and another example which is similar to a mass bouncing on a spring um, would be a blade, like a diving board, okay, uh, which vibrates up and down like you give it a give it a little bit of a, a flick on the end there and it'll go duh, 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 like a ruler held on the edge of a, a bench. Um, so these are all examples of, of simple harmonic motion. There are tons of other examples. Um, and this is where we come to the definition. We look for the common things amongst each of those. So if we're looking for a definition, um, we're going to uh, yeah, try and find um, the one common thing or several common things that will um, help us to, um, I don't know, categorize. And, and that's kind of the way that the nature of science works is you're looking for patterns within things so that you can come up with theory which relates to it. And then um, there's, your, there's your, um, uh, your pattern, your theory, your definition. Okay, so it's defined by the pattern. So one thing very common amongst each of these is that there is periodic motion. That is regular periodic motion, so the pendulum is going to go back and forward consistently. The mass is going to bounce up and down consistently. Same with the diving board or the vibrating blade. It's usually a metal blade clamped to a desk or something if you're doing it in a classroom. And that vibrates up and down periodically as well. <clears throat> and I should say there's usually a mass on the end of that as well. So periodic motion. Um, what can we say about that periodic motion? Um, we might look at the... Um, uh, the forces involved, because physics and mechanics you pretty much always look at forces. So right in the center you've just got force due to gravity. Um, we would call that position the equilibrium position, the position of rest. So let's just write that down. Position of rest is um, what we call the equilibrium Pre-um position. So for the diving board if there's a person standing on the end that's where the diving board sits at rest and then if a person sort of bounces on it, um, then it's no longer at rest, except for that position right in the very middle, but we don't, you know what I mean. Um, so the mass, um, <clears throat> we can simplify the situation of the mass on a spring because obviously you've got the forces with the with the um, spring itself, the, um, uh, and, and I was going to talk about energy, but that's later on, uh, and you've got the force due to gravity on the mass, but the equilibrium positions where those forces are balanced and it just hangs right in the center, nice and easy. Okay, so center, equilibrium position, force is equal to zero. Um, let's just make a little note about that as well. Equal zero, equilibrium. At the extreme positions, so out here, or at the top, or at the top and bottom of the vibrating, that's excessive, it's not to scale, um, <coughs> the force is going to be the greatest. So um, at full, remember periodic motion, usually we talk about amplitude, so at amplitude, that's the maximum amplitude, you get the max force. Okay, and it turns out that um, if we consider for relatively small amplitudes, not for huge amplitudes, but for, for relatively small amplitudes in most of these cases, the, um, the, the force, the, that's the restoring force to bring it back in the center, okay, whatever that force is, it's proportional to the displacement, <clears throat> and we might talk about the displacement y. The amplitude is when the displacement um, is maximum. So the maximum amplitude, we shouldn't really talk about maximum amplitude, we should talk about the maximum um, displacement is equal to the amplitude, and that's when the max force occurs. So the um, this, it turns out, are the two things, or these are the two things, this is crucial here, absolutely crucial, and this is kind of secondary. Um, it shows that the 
uh, the forces, restoring force is proportional to the displacement and the motion is periodic. Now the reason why we say it's, it's periodic motion as well is because um, the, if you're considering the mass on a spring, when you have no mass on the spring and you put a mass on it, you're extending the spring and there is a force proportional to the displacement there. Okay, but that's different. A static uh, situation is different from a dynamic. So still and moving. A, a, a motionless situation um, where the mass is just hanging there, there is a restoring force pulling up on the, um, on the mass to try and restore the spring to its uh, original length. But the mass is pulling down as well. That restoring force from the spring is proportional to the displacement, but it's different when you're dealing with um, the uh, simple harmonic motion and you've got a dynamic. When you started in motion, it's bouncing up and down and up and down. The restoring force is not going to be um, the same as that. There will be a different formula to represent it, different relationship, but it is still form forces uh, the the um, because it's proportional to the displacement, but we have to introduce this idea of a periodic motion, otherwise we're not dealing with simple harmonic motion. So that's the key idea. Simple harmonic motion has to be peri periodic motion. So for a static um, situation, it's not simple harmonic motion, but the force is still proportional to the displacement. That's what I'm trying to get at. Long story short, okay. So um, how does this relate to circles and sine? I'm tempted to kind of leave that and just carry on, but uh, whoop, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Circles and sine. Um, interestingly, um, with the with the motion of a pendulum or a mass on a spring, it's probably easiest to represent this. This is my mass on a spring. As it bounces up and down, um, it's going to follow a nice sine curve with the maximum displacement and minimum displacement, um, and the equilibrium position being in the centre. Okay, and in, and if you know a lot about uh, sine curves, cosine curves, they can be represented by a circle. And um, once again, I'm, I'm going to brush over something. These are two things which will come in later on, but I'm going to brush over something a little bit quickly here, which is useful for your background info, just to get you mentally prepared for it. We have something called a reference circle, and we have a rotating vector, which we call a phasor. You would have seen this in electricity, perhaps. Um, and if we consider the displacement phasor, and uh, I always get this a little bit mixed up, but um, rotating clockwise, hopefully I got that right, um, you can double check that in your book. I'll double check it now actually, I'll pause and come back. Okay, that was really fortunate that I um, looked that up because I had it wrong. It is in fact anti-clockwise, so scrap that, put the arrow on the other end, it rotates anti-clockwise. Okay, um, and very useful for circular rotational motion. Um, but also for simple harmonic motion, which can be represented by circular motion. I'll change it. Can be represented by rotational motion. See, even we get mixed up with our definitions and things. But the key is, uh, when this is moved, rotating anti-clockwise, remember, scratch that, now your displacement is this amount rather than this amount. And then when it comes down here, your displacement is this amount. And then it hits equilibrium right in the center, and it'll keep rotating around and you take the vertical component of, of that to be the actual displacement, the vertical component from that equilibrium position in the center. Okay, and uh, when you plot that against time, it works out to be the, the sine curve up here. So you can imagine there's all sorts of motion which can be represented by this. So a person pedaling a bike um, can approximate simple harmonic motion, can use sine curves and reference circle to, um, to deal with that because their pedals go around um, and that nice circular motion. <clears throat> anyway, that's going to be incredibly useful later on because we have displacement um, phases, we also have velocity phases and acceleration phases, um, and some formulas which relate to that, and the equations of motion in a different form, which are incredibly useful once again. This is stretched on twice as long as I wanted to, but it gives you, I think, a really good introduction to simple harmonic motion. Um, give you one question to think about, um, and that is a trampoline. Okay, is a trampoline, sounds like a mass on a string, doesn't it? But is a trampoline, SHM, is a trampoline simple harmonic motion? And the answer is yes, but only in some parts of it. I'm not going to tell you which parts, that's up to you to think about. And you can reply in comments to the video or talk to your friends about it. Ask your physics teacher, is a trampoline simple harmonic motion? And which parts of the trampoline motion or the person bouncing on it are simple harmonic motion? There you go. Thanks for the visiting the Physics Lounge, and I hope this has been useful for you.